Welcome to Court Killers, reckoning the world of entertainment is turned upside down, folks. We're just trying to find out how to watch what we want, where we want, whenever we want. Brian, where's the good stuff? Oh, man, we're about to find out, but there's a lot of good stuff. If not here, definitely, definitely coming. Future events such as these will affect you in the future. Let's go on a supply run. Deloitte Research shows average U.S. consumers pay $61 a month for streaming services these days. That's 27% above last year's average of $48. Now, the first thing you're going to think is, yeah, they've been raising the prices, and that is probably a part of it. But it also indicates people have added more services. In fact, 40% said they had canceled a service in the past year compared to 44% last year. That's not a big difference, but it's down implying that fewer people canceled services in the past year than the year before. And so they're paying more because they're keeping services. 64% surveyed say the content on services is worth the price. 64% said, yeah, the content's worth the price. About half said they would cancel if the price went up by $5 a month, though. They're like, we're about at our limit. Uh, this survey shows to me that we are out of that customer acquisition phase that, I, uh, that I've been talking about. We are into the customer satisfaction and monetization phase. And my belief has been that during this phase, services are going to go out of business, they're going to consolidate, they're going to raise prices, and they're going to focus on providing reasons to keep you. We're seeing some of the first right? We're, we're definitely seeing uh, companies go out of business and consolidating. Uh, we're seeing a lot of the price rising. We have not seen the reasons to keep you. The retention stuff hasn't hit yet. To that end, it's worth noting that 67% of respondents said that a way to search for content across multiple services was one of their main complaints. They're like, we just want to look at what's available in the services we subscribe to. We won't, don't have to go hunting around in each one of these services. Now, granted, those ways exist. Customers either don't know about them, like just watch, or they just don't find them useful yet. Uh, so I identify that as a big area for businesses to win over customers and retain them. Now, it's worth noting, there's a company called Watchworthy, which has added a feature to its app to help you decide which streaming services to keep and which to dump. Watchworthy takes data from Ranker, gets some of your preferences, and then recommends not only shows it thinks you will like, but also is now creating ratings of more than 200 services, so you can see which one have catalogs of content that suit your tastes. Uh, not exactly helping you search for the content, but certainly helping you figure out which ones to keep, Brian. There are, uh, and forgive me if this is an oversimplification, or and you could direct us in what order we want to go. There's um, kind of the world writ large uh, 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 of of like you know the the Game of Thrones uh, you know uh, strategic theory of all of this. In which case, we could talk about like how Amazon is kind of winning the game because if you want a thing. Amazon will tell you whether or not you can have it on one of the services that are under their fold, right? right. Uh, and, and you don't have to know about Just Watch. You don't have to know about this or that or the other thing. You could either buy it, you can rent it, or it's coming for free of, in, on, under a stream. We could talk about it from the customer perspective, which is clearly this is an indication of a bit of uh, miscommunication where audiences want simplicity how or at least sorry let me correct that audiences say they want simplicity and that they're paying too much but in actuality they're fine with everything mm -hmm. drifting up uh, uh also this this survey uh correct me if i'm wrong here tom it looked to me like this is entirely um uh streaming services only so some number of these people maybe have cable on top of that yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I have a theory that a large number of the people who complain about the price of streaming are people who still pay for cable. Because right. if you're paying for cable and paying $61 a month for streaming, then yeah, it, it feels like too much, right? If you're not paying for cable, that $61 probably feels quite a bit cheaper. Uh, uh, 100%. And if you uh, are 
uh, uh, following the Brian Brushwood doctrine of cancel everything all the time, buy whatever you want the moment you want it, then you'll probably end up spending even less. But uh, and then thirdly, there's the uh, the the point of view from the streaming services where um, uh, they. I, I, I could think of no game theory and motivation of why they would have anything to complain about or do anything differently for, because they're just watching numbers drift up, which is exactly what they, uh, they want to do as uh, over-the-top streaming sur- uh, suppliers. Yeah, I, I think you're right. The, the fact that retention hasn't become critical, right? Like people are sticking around anyway, uh, means that these companies are focusing on the consolidation side right now. Either, in Paramount's case, seemingly out there actively going, hey, anybody want to pay a good price for, for, for Paramount? Like the entire studio, not, to, not just a part of it. Uh, or they are looking to buy, right? They're the Comcast of the world going, hmm, what makes sense? What could we, what could we snap up uh, and add to our portfolio and flesh out our offering? Uh, and while they focus on that, they are not going to focus on improving your customer experience until they have to. So either uh, you are going to see people decide, you know what, we're not going to keep these services anymore and start to cancel, which honestly, consolidation then becomes a solution for that. Like, oh, that service is is failing. Great. Sell it uh, and fold it into something else. Or uh, somebody decides, you know what? we could probably increase our numbers a little bit right now if we improved our customer interface. You have to really believe that you're improving your customer interface. That's a risky thing to do. But if you do it, suddenly you are stealing people from other folks because everyone goes, hey, that streaming service, man, I love it. You should switch to that one. Uh, And that's a less likely thing to happen, to be honest. So that's why you're not seeing these interfaces improve. So, um, if, if we're going to talk about winners and losers in this environment, um, it seems like, uh, f- uh, forgive me for saying so, it seems like Just Watch is not doing great because it hasn't made the market penetration. I, I in any conversation, uh, are the, am the first person to mention Just Watch, right? Uh, Apple is a little bit picky choosy uh, with who they play nice with. I think Apple could be a winner in this environment because it lets you find most things uh for for my money though like uh amazon makes it very very easy to sign up for a one-week trial and there's one tab you click on to unsubscribe to anything at any time Mm -hmm. and if it's not available on any streaming thing you can rent it for two dollars and 99 cents in hd 199 sd or you could buy it for 9.99 or 14.99 uh, I really feel like everything that we've said up until this point of the show indicates that Amazon's well positioned to be a, a kingmaker and dominate. Yeah, Amazon is well positioned, especially because on top of what you you mentioned, they have Fire OS. So take everything that you mentioned in a tab. And now apply it to the entire operating system of a television or a set-top box, uh, and and you have an even greater ability to send people to things because it doesn't even have to be a streaming service add-on to to Prime Video anymore. They can start to add in all the things that are from competitors like Disney Plus and Hulu. So they are primed in a good way. I so do think more more people really prefer Apple TV or Roku. Uh, for their platform than Fire TV, which gives them still a chance to be the ones who say, hey, you can just use us to find things uh, and don't discount Android uh, or, or Google TV, depending on the interface, right? So uh, who are out there trying to, to get some TV deals as well. I think that's where the next big battle is headed, which is between those platform providers to solve this because the individual services, like as I just mentioned, really aren't motivated to, to fix it within the apps. Well, and, and this is my admitted bias is, as we both know, I, I'm a much bigger fan of sitting at a desktop watching programming than, than waiting for a TV to catch up. Um, and uh, we t- we've talked previously about the fact that set-top boxes go in two, two-year upgrade cycles, whereas televisions tend to go in seven-year upgrade cycles. And uh, 
I inherited a television uh, from a relative, and boy, oh boy, is it almost embarrassing when we have guests <laughs> over, and I'm like, uh, hang on, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know where it is. It's just those those seconds matter for the customer experience, yeah. and and there has been more than one time that I've been like, you know what, let's just walk over to the studio. Let me just Amazon.com, and it's there. Yeah. And if you're using a set-top box that's recent, something that's easy to upgrade, right? Uh, then you don't you don't run into that. But when you have that older TV, if you've been using that TV OS, uh, you do. So I, I think a lot of people still want to watch it on their TV. Uh, I think there will always be a percentage who who don't mind doing it the way you're doing it. Um, but but that TV operating system, that TV interface, is is still going to be uh, a battleground. And it's it's taking place outside of the service providers. Uh, every, every one of them, Google has their own store and YouTube. Apple has Apple TV Plus. Uh, Amazon has Prime Video. And like you say, they're probably the leader in in the in house uh, oper- uh, offerings. Uh, Roku has Roku Channel. Even like they they all have their own in house offering that they're trying to lure you to their platform with, uh, and then be the concierge to to bring you to everything else while the operators of the streams and the makers of the content continue to fight with each other to see who should survive the hunger games of cord killing that's going on you know what i just realized because of what you said was that uh the uh, the only tv os that i use is the one here at modern rogue world headquarters and i and the only friction point I ever encounter is when I'm trying to show somebody something and I have mm-hmm. to wait seven more seconds than I would like or whatever. And I'm now realizing, I mean, what is an updated Roku a uh, hundred bucks? It'll have all the things. If you want the best one, it's less. If you just want to get one of the, the that, that the, seems you know. like a, like I, I just installed an ice maker for one of my guests. <laughs> it seems like I should bother to. <laughs> you could pay thirty five dollars for a mid range Roku stick. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, for sure. And you know what? The fact that you you know this, right, and you just didn't really think about it, makes me wonder how how many other people are just sitting there with their TVs, going, "Well, I guess it's just old and slow," you know, like. That is an opportunity for Roku and Apple and Fire TV uh, and Google Chrome and Shield TV and all of them to to sort of get the message out of like, your old slow TV doesn't have to stay slow. Upgrade now with the Shield TV, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I, I think that's just a blind spot mostly because I, I just don't have to encounter that friction very often. And it's yeah. only when I do that I'm like, well, it must be something with the weather, <laughs> you know? Yeah. The other thing I thought was interesting in this survey is the the youngest demo, the Gen Z demo, 49% say they watch shows after hearing about them from creators online. You know what? Creators might be the new curators. Right. Because like They're so close in pronunciation. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a clever turn of phrase and I'm glad that I just wrote it. <laughs> but like there's a podcast called uh, I think Script Notes and it has a uh, Craig Manson the guy that did The Last of Us and Chernobyl and it's like when that dude tells me what he likes I listen, you know, yeah. same thing with uh, Kevin Smith, same thing with Dan Harmon. It's like, uh, I don't know. I like that idea of curators uh, or yeah. creators being the new curators. And and people say it about us, right? You know, not to toot our own, own horn too loud, but we definitely get emails regularly like, thank you for recommending X, Y, or Z, you know, for, for either one of us. So I think it really does. Uh, it really does mean that people should pay for this show. Yeah. If only there was some way. Tom, I had a mm. dream. Yeah. That there was a way that somebody could just click a button once mm. and they could, you know, never even notice a few bucks a month. Keep this show loud, live, and independent. Wow. Get special yeah. benefits, imagine? exclusive content. And then I woke up and I was like, that was the stupidest dream ever. 
You're an idiot, Brian Brushwood. You were dreaming about Patreon.com slash cord killers. And I said, why am I shouting at myself? And I was mm -hmm. like, because you're so dumb. And then my wife said, shut up. And then I was like, Penny, get over here. But then I realized my daughter's off at college. I was like, Callie, get over here. Then she, I realized <laughs> she's over at school. And I was like, Josie. And then she, she was at school too. So anyway, I just wrote down on this note card, I wrote down uh, Patreon.com slash cord killers. It's a way to give us money, keep us live, live and in Independent, get early access, exclusive access to our after, after uh, talking segments. Uh, yeah, it's good. You know what, best friend? You're not dumb. Because patreon.com slash cord killers really does exist, and it's the best way to support this show directly. Thank you. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, Don't you're never going to see anyone... my dream, though. <laughs> you're different. <laughs> Do you hear that? Uh, yes. It's time for the search party. Uh, within the search party, we figure out what kinds of stuff is out there. And then as creators, we curate it <laughs> to pass along to you. Uh, Peacock's 2024 Paris Olympics coverage comes July 26th, uh, almost exactly four months away, and will include enhanced multi-view options this time around. So in the course of doing frame rate and cord killers over the years, I've gone from, hey, Brian, I had to VPN in order to watch the Olympics live uh, in London to, oh, NBC actually lets you watch some of the Olympics live. It's not the main broadcast, but you can get it in this weird gold app. Uh, to last year, oh crap, they put everything on Peacock. So you can just have a Peacock subscription and watch the Olympics. This year, they're actually improving Peacock such that Peacock's coverage will be superior to what you get anywhere else. 5,000 hours of live coverage across the two weeks, including each of the 329 medal events. If you're on a TV, a tablet, or a browser, not the phone, but everything else, you'll be able to watch four matches at the same time. Peacock Discovery Multiview aims to direct you to the most important events, so you can see an on-screen description telling you whether there's an elimination risk or if this is a medal event, stuff like that, uh, or maybe there's a first-time Olympian, you know, somebody going for a record. And then Peacock Live Actions helps you follow the events you're most interested in. So you can tell it like, hey man, I love live gymnastics. And the whip around coverage on the gold show, which normally is entirely curated by NBC. They're like, we're going to take you to the most important events. will honor your preference. And when it's about to switch over to weightlifting, it will let you keep watching gymnastics while it keeps weightlifting in front of everyone else. You keep watching gymnastics and weightlifting is in one of the other smaller boxes. Uh, so you can hit a button to keep watching the action on the parallel bars. I, I know that not everybody's in the Olympics and Brian, I know you're not that into the Olympics compared to me, uh, but it is amazing to see that we have finally arrived on. We'll show you everything live. We'll actually make it easy to follow multiple events. And that's all on streaming. If you just want to sit back and watch three hours of pre-recorded coverage in prime time, we'll have that on cable TV. But if you want to watch everything, if you want to have everything at your fingertips, Peacock's the place to go. So I, I know neither of us know the answer to my question, uh, but number one, I assume that both of us have known for a, a decade plus that eventually we would get to this moment, right? Um, right, right. Uh, and we've seen everything happen in fits and starts for various reasons and everything from licensing to restrictive contracts to, uh, you know, previous engagements or technology. Um, if you were to guess, it sounds to me, like this is the year where Tom Merritt finally gets at least the promise of all his dreams coming true for Olympic coverage. Would you guess that they finally cracked a technological code or that bandwidth finally was free enough or that, uh, or would you guess that uh, contracts had expired or would you guess that maybe the fact that um, it's a Western European uh, location in France makes it to where the vast majority of the viewing audience will be able to watch real time and would be interested in watching in real time. Uh, do you have a favorite take on that? 
my favorite take is the is the the licenses and and deals, right? Uh, because I think one of the things in in years past that kept them from moving more things online were agreements with cable providers, right? There were probably agreements with cable providers that you can't show all of your Olympic coverage online because that'll keep people from watching it on cable and paying for cable. Well, those days ended a while ago, right? So probably more recently, it was, okay, do we have the 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 manpower to put into developing the interface? Uh, and are we going to undercut the ad revenue if we move things online where we're not selling ads as much uh, versus the ads that we sell on cable TV. So, so the, the manpower is, is, is more of like a cost and then we don't want to be spending money on something that's actually going to lose us money because it undermines the ad revenue has probably been the more recent, you know, slow go of, of features. And I think this is the year where they're like, yeah, we, we've, we've been selling ads on Peacock for a couple of years now. We can sell the crap out of ads on Peacock. Maybe we can sell more ads on Peacock uh, than we can on cable TV. Listeners, viewership is declining on cable TV anyway. More people are going to watch it if we put it on Peacock. So the incentives just shifted, right? So, so, I, so I think so it's, even, it's even a if, little bit of, of the incentives of the audience, but also the, the, the business model has changed. Okay. So maybe I over projected like it sounds to me like you believe that even if the olympics were in perth or the philippines or whatever yeah. uh they, they would st it's still the right time to do this kind of stuff yeah i mean the 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 time difference is always there um and you've got an Olympics coming to LA in four years where there won't be a time difference so if it was the time difference i feel like it would be happening next time right um I, and and honestly I don't think it matters all that much. I think what they've realized is people will watch this because it's on almost all the time, right? The Olympics start in the morning in their location and go late into the evening in their location. So there's like eight hours where there's no Olympics. So no matter where you live on the planet, part of your day, there's going to be live stuff. So yeah, I don't, I don't know that the location matters as much. How do you personally, as somebody who digs the Olympics, expect that you'll probably consume it the most oh i the last time uh when they had stuff on peacock i went back and forth between the nbc sports app and peacock because peacock was a little bit glitchy um actually that was two times the last summer olympics the last winter olympics i i watched it mostly on peacock because they they had figured it out so yeah this time i'm probably just going to be streaming it all on peacock i'm not even going to think about it on on tv is my guess uh as somebody who is mildly interested, I will be watching the summaries every day. <laughs> well, and that's the beauty of it, right? Is you'll be able to turn on Peacock and go, just tell me what happened, right? And they'll have that. Th that's what the multi-view and the whip around and all of these coverages are, are great for. Basically, like I might yell at a smart device, like, smart device, are we winning the good guys? How? Yes, a lot? the Soviet Union is winning. <laughs> Wait. Smart assistant. What are you trying to say? <laughs> um, speaking of winning, uh, Furiosa is winning uh, your hearts and minds with its new trailer that is out showing Anna, Taylor Joy, uh, and Chris Hemsworth all battling the Mad Max Fury Road prequel coming May 24th. Did you did you watch the trailer? I sure did. Um, and? Uh, I, I, I mean, I don't want to spoil the other trailer that we watched, but apparently licensing David Bowie music is very popular these days. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> what, did they have a sale? That's a, yeah. it's, I'm curious. Yeah. Um, no, it, uh, 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 it looks... Uh, I'll say fantastic. It looks fantastic. However, it also looks um, much, much more... Uh, 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 CGI'd than Mad Max Fury Road did, you know, and and uh, but then again, uh, uh, Fury Road was a obnoxiously long production process, uh, and and it looks good whether you have any CGI or not. Um, uh, in terms of the energy of it, am I right in reading that that Chris Hemsworth is supposed to be uh, what's his name, the the creepy old dude? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um that that that's that's what makes sense to me anyway. Yeah. Uh no, it it uh, uh it looked great. It's a good trailer. Uh I'm going to see it no matter what. Um 
I, you know, I got three girls. I'm just trying to figure out which ones are prepped to watch which uh, Furiosa content at what age. Who of them have seen Mad Max Fury Road? Uh, I, I think Penny maybe sat through it, maybe, or most of it, but mostly was looking at her iPad. Josie seemed to really like it, but she was like 11 at the time. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. And so I think she's due to watch it again. <laughs> Refresh her memory. Uh, and, yeah. and, 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 and the youngest and, probably didn't see it because she was too young. Well, right? and possibly Callie, it's time. Be, uh, like, like there's, there's gross imagery, but it's not too visceral. Well, actually, oh, I shouldn't say that. Mm. Hey. Anyway, Not for us, <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. a I'm a big big fan of of this new age of Mad Max, and I'm a big big fan of Furiosa, and yeah. So the other trailer that had Bowie music in it was The Acolyte. Uh, that show will be available for streaming on Disney Plus starting June 4th, and you'll get a sneak peek at it if you go to the theatrical re-release of Star Wars The Phantom Menace happening May 3rd to celebrate the 25th anniversary of The Phantom Menace. So if... The Phantom Menace isn't enough to get you to see the Phantom Menace. They'll show you some of the Acolyte ahead of time. Ah, yes. The 25th anniversary of the time I saw Meet Joe Black so that I could watch the trailer for the Phantom Menace. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe some people saw the Water Boy. <laughs> I have very fond memories. In fact, when I saw this, it almost makes me want to go to the theater to see The Phantom Menace just to kind of have a whiff of nostalgia for jumping on an Austin City bus to the Highland Mall to go watch Phantom Menace for the first time uh, with my friend uh, and being so excited that even after I'd seen it, I wanted to see it two more times so that I could study the lore points uh, around Obi Wan and R two D two and 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 such. Uh, so you know, like if I, who otherwise really don't like the Phantom Menace, have that uh, reaction, uh, I know there are plenty of people who actually really really did like the Phantom Menace uh, are going to go see this, and then putting the acolyte in there as a way to be like, hey, those of you who saw me, Joe Black, to see the Phantom Menace, what about seeing actual content from the acolyte? Uh, t uh, two things we've talked about, uh, both of which I've said before, but but just to reinforce, um, it is possible to really, really love a thing, but also acknowledge that it's not very good. And I used to just like really not understand anybody who liked the Phantom Menace. But then I was like, bro, you like Tron? I'm like, yeah, Tron's pretty good. <laughs> and then, but but it's also not good. Uh, uh, <laughs> likewise, uh, one of my favorite memories of all times will be waiting until midnight with, of all people, uh, Ernest Klein to watch The Phantom Menace. It was really great. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, a couple other notes here. The Boy and the Heron, uh, which just won an Oscar for animation, uh, will be arriving on Netflix outside of the U.S. and Japan. Presumably it's on Crunchyroll in the U.S. and Japan. Uh, but another example of Netflix getting prime material where it can, even if it can't get it in every market. And uh, Doctor Who trailer is out. Shudi Gatwa meeting dinosaurs, traveling through time. Uh, and the new Doctor has appeared in the Christmas special, but the, the first of Shudi Gatwa's full Doctor episodes uh, coming May 11th. Man, I watched that trailer and I was like, yeah, we should turn and face the strange ch ch changes. <laughs> uh, it was a good trailer. It was really good. I, I was into it. Yeah. Um, uh, I like the fact that they they did a little bit of wordplay of um, uh, of of like sometimes it's like a fantasy. <laughs> uh, I like the fact that Doctor Who is always good at, at what I think of as big world and small world storytelling, where it's like, uh, maybe, maybe, you know, a girl passing an exam is the most important thing ever. Maybe it's cosmic uh, uh, detonations or something. Uh, Russell T. Davies is back in charge. He was in charge under Christopher for the Christopher Eccleston and, and David Tennant episodes. Uh, he was in charge for the recent David Tennant specials. I feel like the specials were very much a love letter to the first run of Doctor Who. They were good, but they weren't new. 
I feel like now we're going to see, can Russell T. Davis do new Doctor Who with a very different doctor, right? Shudi Gatwa uh, is, is not the same character. Uh, he's not the same age <laughs> uh, as previous doctors. Like, we've we've got a young doctor again. Obviously, he's a black doctor, so that's the first time we've had a, a, an African descent uh, doctor. So, with a lot of different aspects of the doctor here to explore, and yet some of that trailer, I'm like, yeah, that could have been a David Tennant episode. That that little stick with the butterfly, totally yep. could see that with uh, a David I, Tennant. I, episode. The uh, it it is interesting, and uh, I'll leave it to uh, more qualified uh, academics to weigh in on it. But um, uh, the energy, the manic energy of the Doctor seems same as always. Yeah. Uh, but I find myself second guessing, like like, well. Do I only feel like that because he's black or what? Like, and I, I literally nah. don't know how to feel. But, but the character no, seems I don't, I don't to be written that, the same. I, that was one thing I noticed in the trailer, and and I actually noticed it in his appearance on on the last of the uh, on the Christmas special. Um, he he and all of the doctors since Eccleston uh, have had a through line of a certain element of the personality and the personalities are very different from doctor to doctor to doctor, but there's some kind of peace that they've been able to preserve. And I'm just wondering, like, is there a sheet of paper that says, uh, do these three things you can do, you can make choices for everything else you do, but, but follow these three things and you will be the doctor, uh, or whether it's just kind of a meme where they all have seen each other's previous performances and, capture a piece of it. I, I don't know, but I, I noticed that too, right? There, there's, there's definitely an element of all the other doctors that, that he is channeling and that manic energy, like you're talking about. Whatever that, that, that thing is, would you say it could be corrected by Adderall? <laughs> uh, for a time Lord? I don't know. Yeah. Gallifreyans <laughs> may not, may not be subject to the effects of Adderall. It's hard, it's hard to say, Hey, look at this. It's time for the buried treasure. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, are you saying you haven't been able to watch TV? Is that what you're trying to tell me? You know what? I uh, had a lot going on, and unfortunately, I have been reporting all the things I've been watching. But when you have multiple children, and you also make a habit of trying to rewatch things to figure out why they're good, I don't have much new to report. Uh, but I can report that I've been looking at the moon. You know what today is? Today is the last full moon before the total <gasps> solar eclipse. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And the total solar eclipse is coming on April 8th. Austin, Texas is right on the edge of, of totality. And that is why I will be traveling to Austin, Texas on April 8th uh, to celebrate the disappearance of the sun. Will it come back? We don't know. It has before. Yeah. A lot of but people like past to Past performance talk about is not uh, sure a few, uh, that is not a guarantee of future performance, Brian. Well, I, I, I like to think of it less as the disappearance of the sun and more as uh, the appearance of the moon. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the <La> moon. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was kind of neat because I, I opened up my Google calendar and it said full moon. And I was like, full moon? Moons run at 28 day cycles. That means 14 days for. <gasps> <laughs> we are 14 days away uh, from, from us all gathering. All of us. If you're listening to the sound of my voice, you too could be just hanging out, watching Luna show up at Brian's property. Yeah. Uh, three, con uh, three concerts, uh, two comedy shows, two silly game tournaments, all the food, uh, uh, you, uh, you can camp the night before, you can camp the night after. You're not going to get a better deal. Head on over to foundersdayeclipse.com. It's going to be amazing. I cannot wait. I just uh, nailed down the last of the details of, of uh, my logistics of, of getting there. So you all need to join me. How, how, do, how would they join you? How would they join me? How would they join any of us? Uh, they would go to foundersdayeclipse.com and buy a ticket. Uh, we, we have three days of silly adventures, uh, uh, only one of which is like a VIP thing, but it'll be worth it. Uh, yeah. Uh, come on down. Let's hang out. That's what Brian is doing between now and April 8th. He's watching the moon while I watch Detroiters. <gasps> 
Oh, Tom, what was it like? What was it like, Tom? Because because so, I know that you don't like to be bullied into watching things, so I've been trying to play cool, like, oh, you know, I, 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 Detroit is pretty... <laughs> It's pretty good. <laughs> it just just seems like something you'd like. I definitely, I definitely am obstinate enough that the more someone pushes me to watch something, the less likely I am to watch it. And I appreciated that you weren't doing that, which raised Detroiters on my list. Uh, the fact that they're only like twenty two minutes long raised it even more on my list. But my, I just didn't have a lot of space in my schedule to be adding things. So one evening, I was like, huh. I've, you know, I've got like an hour here. I've got nothing I have to watch. Uh, you know what? It would be fun. I, I just, just watching something fun. I like Tim Robinson. I trust Brian. Uh, where's this Detroiters? And I popped it on and it was everything you described. Like <laughs> the manic fun and comedy of I think you should leave is in there. Hiding in little, little spaces and little corners and little exchanges and little sticks. But it's so much more heart. Uh, the interplay between Sam Richardson and Tim Robinson is just so joyful. It constantly makes me think, okay, so the obvious joke here for even I think you should leave would be X. And they just go, I love you, man. <laughs> or something, you know, something that's a total positive left turn. That was the, the part that delighted me is like they could have just gone dark uh, multiple times and they don't. Now, and they don't shy away from, from difficult issues and putting a button on them from time to time. But it's just so fun. It, it, it is, it is shockingly devoid of cynicism and, and yes, it's a cynical world in which they live. I mean, hell it's set in Detroit, but they don't see it like, like the, the, I don't know if you've gotten there. There's a scene where two very cynical individuals, uh, owe, uh, them money and they're all like, uh, well, legally on the books. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a very difficult year, but I can walk away from this chair full of money. And uh, look, wait. Oh, no, very... no. I, we can sig significantly glance at this giant envelope on this chair, uh, hypothetically. And then, uh, and then it's like they just turn around and they're like, man, what a bummer that they've had a rough year. That they year had too. such a bad year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, 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 uh, the, um, is it a wedding? I think it's a wedding where the clown shows up. Oh, uh, it's his, it's his dad's birthday. Uh, his dad's it, birthday. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he keeps like, come on, do a clown thing for me. <laughs> and then it has, I won't spoil it, but it has such a touching resolution, uh, that you <laughs> with again, a, you're, that, that literally ends with a, Week. Oh, yep. <laughs> so good. So good. Uh, yeah, I am partway through season two now. Uh, just did the family reunion episode. Hey, uh, you're, you're ahead of me then because my family has forbidden me from continuing forward. Oh, really? So I've rewatched the first like eight episodes of season one because uh, like apparently – only at Thanksgiving are we all allowed to watch it. <laughs> well, I won't. I won't spoil anything. Uh, but uh, it it continues to deliver uh, and even even expand the universe um, and 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 bring people in that you never thought you would see. Um, while also, like every once in a while, you're like. That was an I think you should leave sketch that didn't make it to I think you should leave, and they just shoehorned it in, and it was it was great. Good job. Well um, done. Uh, do we know why it didn't get picked up? Was it just like a casualty of the pandemic, or I don't know. I, I have all kinds of theories, but yeah, I don't know if anybody uh, out there has has actually dug that up. I haven't gone looking uh, to find out. To be Poor honest, it was on Comedy Central com. though, so that makes me think that you know. Comedy Central just deprioritized sketch comedy, maybe. It was not uh, even sketch comedy. It's a sitcom. It's a full-on sitcom. It, 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 yes. Uh, Cordkillers at gmail.com if you know something we don't. All right, folks. Uh, you may have thought that when Brian was talking about watching the moon, that that was us promoting our personal project, but you'd be wrong. That was us talking about Brian watching the moon and the fact that Love that's it. a real thing that he needs to do and why. Here's the promotional aspect of the show. I got a book out. Uh, it is 37% funded by 167 supporters. And if you are one of those 167, I thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for pre-ordering. Uh, if you are among the people who refuse to ever, ever buy this book, 
uh, I respect you. I understand. I will not push you anymore. But if you're that person who's like, oh, right, I wanted to pick up Synced, understand technology and make it work for you. The the book that Tom's writing, I wanted to pre-order it. I wanted to help make that book happen. I wanted to maybe get my name in the back of the book so I could show that I made that happen. And I definitely want to be able to go like, wait a minute, what's the deal with Byte Dance? Or how does an algorithm actually work and just be able to pull Tom's work down from the shelf and look it up? Then you need to go to Tom's new book.com and pre-order synced understand technology and make it work for you uh tom i'm not gonna lie there was a brief moment that i was terrified that uh your new book was going to be called uh uh wait i just went, went to tom's new book and it went somewhere else tom's new book.com tom's new yeah, better not have gone to Boing Boing. That would have been weird. Okay, there it is. Okay. Yeah, there it is. All right, all right. <laughs> For a split second, I was terrified that your new book was going to be titled Why I Skipped Out on My Appearance at Founder's Day by the Moon. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Definitely I, I, not. I support Definitely. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on it. <laughs> yeah. You can you can hang do it get a hangout you can you can uh, get on Daily Tech News Show uh, or you can just get the book uh, Tom's New Book dot com. Whatever you do, do it out of the rain. Never sounds because, like rain to me, Tom. It always sounds like yeah. something else. Ooh, now thunder. Let's scan the horizon. ESPN has done something interesting. It has begun integrating regional sports networks into its app and website. So starting this week, uh, if you're a subscriber to Nesson, the Boston area regional sports network, that's the one that has the Red Sox on it, uh, you can access Nesson programming through a link in ESPN's app and website. Uh, later this week, uh, Washington DC's MSN uh, well, I'm sorry, later later in May, uh, MSN will be added. That'll be in time for the WNBA season. Uh, Nesson-operated Sportsnet Pittsburgh will arrive later this year. The integration is just a link, uh, so you will be taken to the app or website for that RSN. You will have to have a subscription and log in through that RSN, but it is a way for ESPN to say, hey, uh, you want to watch the Red Sox game? Uh, click here. If you're a Nesson subscriber or if you have MLB TV and you can watch Nesson stuff, they, you can go do that. Go do it. Here. Click here. Uh, it's an interesting way of ESPN being more than just a provider of sports programming, but being the platform of where to find the sports broadcasts. Would, would I be wrong, Tom, if, if I were to create a parallel to this uh, announcement being similar to uh, Amazon being the provider for your uh, HBO Max or, or or whatever. Like, because I know that you have been vexed many times with blackout issues. And if this got them around it and they were just the gateway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought up the blackout thing because this does nothing to get you around blackout issues. Okay, like, you, you have to have the subscription. Uh, it also is not like Amazon Prime Video because ESPN isn't providing the content. It's not an add-on to ESPN the way you can add on Paramount Plus to Amazon. Okay. This is more like what you get on Roku or on uh, Google TV or Apple TV where ESPN is saying, hey, we're showing you all the news around the Boston Red Sox. We showed you the, the schedule that the Red Sox are playing right now. We can link you to that game if ESPN carries it or one of our networks carries it. But we can also link you to the game at Nesson, right? So it's it's outside of ESPN's network. ESPN isn't providing it, but they can send you there, right? They are aggregating the information and saying, "Oh yeah, go go watch it here." Uh, when uh, last question, are are they doing this out of a uh, uh, a sense of wanting to build up this ecosystem, or do you think they're doing it because they're getting an affiliate thing like a Just Watch situation? <laughs> I, yeah, it's a good question. I do. It does seem like ESPN is positioning itself to be like, when you want to know what's happening in sports, go to ESPN, whether we have the video or not. Right. Uh, the other thing that's coming later this year is that integrated service of Warner Brothers, uh, ESPN, Disney, 
and uh, so, so, so Paramount. This, this may be a tee up to an ecosystem. And so, yeah, yeah. exactly. Like they're they're adding Nessun right now, but they're certainly going to add that service later and be like, hey, th this one's on TNT, uh, but you can get that through our combined thing. Go, go click and go that, over there. That, uh, that seems extremely savvy. We've talked for over a decade about how, you know, ESPN was addicted to uh, cable uh, 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 subsidies, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and now it seems like they're making a very uh, far-sighted move to uh, position themselves well for the next decade. Yeah, yeah. They're, uh, they're only drinking in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was about to say they've kicked the subsidy, but they have it. They still have their... Oh, got their, it, got their, it. Uh, yeah. man, you suddenly made ESPN into a relief pitcher <laughs> with an amazing mustache. <laughs> <laughs> uh, YouTube TV has begun rolling out multi-view on the iPhone and iPad. Uh, the feature went live on television versions of YouTube TV last year. This is YouTube TV, not YouTube. So YouTube TV, the cable replacement service. Uh, and it will now let you watch up to four channels at once. Uh, multi-view will not arrive on Android for a few more months. Um. Uh, oh, maybe that's an after talk segment is uh, I, I really am curious about the the purpose and the future of of, of watching four channels at once well it's sports it's it's almost yeah. entirely like oh it's march madness i want to watch four basketball games at once i can do it on my youtube tv app on my tv oh now i can do it on my iphone and ipad yeah a uh, private equity company called Apollo was apparently, uh, according to Deadline, interested in buying Paramount Global Studios, but not all of Paramount, just the movie studio. Uh, that caused quite a bit of a stir. And then reportedly, Sherry Redstone, who is Paramount's majority shareholder, said, no, you want to buy the whole thing, I'll listen. But I am not interested in selling it for parts. I'm not selling off the studio separately, at least not for now. Uh, Tom? I, I mm -hmm. like to project narratives onto things. Uh, would I be completely wrong to fantasize about a version of, so you want to buy the one definitely good part and leave everything else? Oh, I, I'm not, I don't want to disc Paramount Studios. Uh, they, they are putting out good movies. Uh, but oh, no, the no, good no, part that, is Paramount. But, 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 isn't that the part they were going to buy? That's the part Apollo wanted to buy, yeah. but I'm like, what I, what I say, I don't want to diss uh, Paramount Global Studios. I don't know if it is the most valuable part of Paramount. Okay. I uh, would assume Paramount Plus might be a little bit of a more of a growth opportunity than the studios. I could be wrong about that, though. Yeah, the, the, it is interesting how uh, game theory uh, establishes that, like, uh, you kind of want to keep everything as one entity. And this is the push pull of, you know, we've talked about how, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of splitting off brands into individual verticals. But when you do go into, you know, giant conglomerates, you probably want to keep that conglomerate all together in one piece and not just sell <laughs> off pieces of it. Yeah. Uh, and, and Sherry Redstone uh has has been a, a decent steward of her father's legacy uh sumner redstone was a, a titan of of the media industry he's the one that split viacom and cbs into two while still owning both of them in order to try to increase his shareholder value and then it was sherry who brought them back together to increase their shareholder value so um it uh it's it's definitely a succession-like situation. Speaking of which, <laughs> oh, I, Brian I, I, Cox is going to be the voice of Santa Claus in a Netflix animated feature called That Christmas. That is true. I, I won't take that away from you. All right. <laughs> I was going to make a joke about mitosis and symbiosis, but you you dusted me on that one. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Brian, Brian Cox, of course. Wait, why am I blanking on the name of the patriarch of, of succession? Uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> F, F off. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need to remember. Yeah. yeah. And now he's Santa Claus. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. No, I I can think of no better Santa Claus than somebody who uh, has a reputation as a character actor for getting things done at that level. 
Roy, right? Wasn't oh, it the yeah. Roy's? I, I, I almost wore my 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 Royco Waystar. Yeah, Waystar Royco. That's or, that's how hat. I was able to remember. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Oscars audience uh, was 21 million after you counted all the viewing, including delayed multi-platform viewing. That's up 5% from last year and the largest multi-platform audience for the Oscars since 2020. Now, keep in mind, 2020 always raises COVID alarm bells, but the Oscars took place before lockdowns in 2020. They took place in January uh, when COVID was just that weird thing coming out of China news. So it was not affected by that. Multi-platform, huh? All the platforms? So that means streaming and television. And and cable. I I I say, uh, why stop there? Let's include hearts and minds. Well wishes. <laughs> no, what what are you trying to say? That oh, it's that you know. shouldn't count a stream the same as a, a view on tel- on on cable. I mean, look, uh, you know how I am about the hooray for Hollywood awards. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. You're like great, good for you, Oscars. <laughs> like, says uh, the independent podcaster. <laughs> so, uh, how do you feel about Taylor Swift? Uh, love her. She's in as indie as it gets. It's awesome. Okay, so here you go. The Eras Tour is now the most watched music film ever on Disney Plus. Good, good. That's what it means. <laughs> Which to me is like damning it with faint praise. Like four point six million views is, is not not bad. Uh, Disney Plus has had a BTS concert and maybe another concert that I don't know about. So. Oh, Calling I, it the I, most I, I, watched music film ever on Disney Plus feels like okay. Oh, Hamilton. Hamilton was a, I guess a. That's is that a concert though? I don't know if that's a concert. Anyway, it was a, it was a weird thing to tout. But four point six million. That's a, that's a lot of people well, watching. Well, uh, who was doing the touting? Was it was it Disney Plus or Taylor Swift? I uh, no, it was Deadline. Um, but yeah, I imagine it was Disney releasing this. Uh, like like I. I Taylor looks like. Okay. Okay. Like, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Other Disney plus concert and music events include Elton John farewell from Dodger stadium. Black is King, a film by Beyonce. I did not realize that was on Disney plus and the Beatles get back. And she crushed all of them. Taylor crushed Beyonce, the Beatles. <laughs> and also Taylor Swift folklore, the long pond studio sessions. <laughs> Uh, so she crushed herself. I mean, sounds like Taylor is uh, 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 doing all right. <laughs> yeah, I think she's doing okay, for sure. <laughs> all right, let's check the chatter. If you haven't checked Spoiler in Time lately, uh, of course, it comes to the patrons first, but everybody can get it as a podcast of its own. We have been changing the experience to what we're calling the full experience. So we watch four episodes of a series. The first, the ultimate, AKA the highest rated, the lowest rated, and the last, uh, the full experience. And we've been getting recommendations for what we should watch. We're in the middle of watching Six Million Dollar Man right now. Cappy wrote in and said, the one that I yelled out loud when I first heard you all doing this for spoiling time was Lost. After digesting Cheers, I now really want shows like the original Full House, Family Matters, etc. But after thinking about it more, Faulty Towers would be perfect. I've never experienced that one. That would be a great one because uh, like the whole conceit is that everyone talks about it, but we want to get the full experience by which we mean we want to watch exactly four episodes. (laughs) (laughs) I have watched most, but not all of faulty towers. And in fact, I've never watched the last episode. So that would, that would be a fun one. Good, good, good one. Cappy. If anybody doesn't know faulty towers was John Cleese. uh, And a couple of the people who were involved in Monty Python, but none of the main cast members of Monty Python. Uh, It was him as a curmudgeonly hotel owner. Um, and it was a classic. Oh, I do okay. remember a, a snippet here or there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bai Shen wrote, I'm a bit confused why Brian is against this. Why is people knowing how much they're going to pay a bad thing? He's referring, of course, to the FCC requiring cable companies in the U.S. to charge exactly what they say they will charge in their advertisements. So if it's going to cost you $56 a month with fees, you have to advertise it as $56 a month, not $39.99 plus fees. Um, 
Baishen says, it's like how all the airlines decided to make their fares look cheaper by removing everything and then charging you fees to get it back, or companies that advertise low costs but then have high shipping and handling. Regardless of where the costs come from, people should not be having surprises in what they pay. Most people don't have savings, so surprises like that can easily screw them over. That's that's an entirely legitimate point, and I think uh, my my impulse comes from uh, oh man, I must have been like 20 or 21 years old when I found out that uh, uh, packs of cigarettes almost entirely were taxes and the actual tobacco cost very little or uh, the gasoline was almost entirely taxes and the actual gasoline cost very little. Um, and I was like uh, and then I got upset when I found out that it was literally illegal to display, hey, we're charging 69 cents per gallon these are the fees that the government is imposing upon us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm a big fan of disclosure, uh, but I, I suppose that's a really good point. It does. That's a knife that cuts both ways because, you know, is, is, uh, is it more deceptive to imply that you're only making a little bit of money when there's a bunch of fees and then you get the bill and the bill is very big. As a matter of fact, this might be one that I'll, I'll kick back. And if anyone else has a different take cord killers at gmail.com, but uh, I, I, I think it's just a visceral reaction on my part. Uh, did you have a strong opinion on this one, Tom? Yes. My strong opinion is they should have to say what they're going to charge. Cause these aren't government fees. I mean, yes, Tax is one of them, but it's not even the biggest one. These are fees that they make up. Yes, which and so complicates I think it's my argument. <laughs> I think it's unfair to say it's forty dollars a month plus the we want to get make you pay for other people's sports fee and the oh we have to carry local channels because it's the law. Uh, even though we pay them, so we'll just add that as a fee. We don't have to. Like, yeah, tax is one thing, but. Most of that stuff is not well, and, but, but, but then you get like a, there, there's a couple of strange mushy middle things that are hard for me to read. Like uh, when you go to Las Vegas, you find out how much the room is and then you oh, arrive, the resort fee, the yeah. resort fee. And it's like, they're not lying. They really do have a masseuse and a pool and a et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's like, I, 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 I I am not firmly committed to uh, this is not a hill I'm willing to die on, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, gotcha. I do want to express that's where this comes from in on my end. Uh, Mike wrote in uh, and pointed out he's someone who used to run a roof mounted antenna into an H HD home run uh, channel server on a Mac mini uh, only so he could watch Jeopardy every night with having, without having to switch HDMI inputs. And he says, I can tell you that legally watching Jeopardy is a pain in the ass if you don't get your locals in some type of package. Ditto for Wheel of Fortune, if that's more your speed. I swear I'm not as old as those viewing habits make me sound. Uh, this is this is funny, Mike. Thank you for writing in. I, I looked around, and yes, and Mike acknowledges, if you can get your local TV channels through YouTube TV or Hulu Live or something like that, uh, then you can, you can watch these fine. Uh, sometimes... The network that carry or the channel that carries these isn't available because not every local channel is in every package. Uh, you can watch Jeopardy. I didn't look up Wheel of Fortune, but you can watch Jeopardy on Pluto TV, but it's not going to – if you're like, no, I want to watch tonight's episode of Jeopardy. Oh, uh, got it. Okay. You know, All right. It's not always going to be the same thing, but uh, there is a Jeopardy channel. There. I, I, I thought the exact same thing. I thought uh, uh, surely sitting on – a half a century of of curated written content is not just going unused, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Pluto thing makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got another email here from Andrew. I'm a big fan of Cord Killers since the frame rate twit days. Love your work. Blah blah blah. Thank you, Andrew. Just saw Dune Part Two at an AMC theater on Sunday morning, March 17th. Showtime was 10 a.m. The final IMAX fanfare before the actual movie started began at. 10.36. Showtime was 10 a.m. 36 minutes later. 
I had gone to see this movie by myself as my wife and our 10 year old daughter weren't interested in seeing this particular movie. Had it been a movie that my wife was interested in seeing, she most definitely would have remarked on the amount of promotional content trailers, etc. In general, I enjoy the content before a movie begins, particularly the trailers. I'm less enthused with the other promotional content, but I'm able to ignore it. And I don't believe the rules regarding putting away your electronic devices apply until they dim light and trailers commence. What are your thoughts? Is 36 uh, minutes excessive? I I have a hot take on my experience, but 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 Tom, I, I would love to hear your opinion first. I think that's excessive. I I also love the trailers. I also don't mind the promotional announcements. I can ignore them. Uh, but I've even had a situation where Eileen and I have looked at each other and been like, "Really, we're getting another trailer?" Like, I. I know that it's nice to have a little buffer in case you're running late, especially in Los Angeles where the traffic can be bad. But do we need a 36 minute buffer? That's that seems a little long. Uh, oh, you know what? I I can't vouch for whether or not my experience was um, beginning at the stated showtime, but I will absolutely state that I think it was 22 minutes long at the Alamo Draft House, where they pretty much did a documentary to bring you up to speed on every version of Dune that it has ever been just all of these, uh, fair use licensed or fair use clips of the David Lynch version, you know, uh, clips from, uh, Jodorowsky's Dune, uh, 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 clips from the CD ROM game clips from the sci-fi series. And they introduced you to all of the characters. I was like, I am having an actively superior experience by sitting through 22 minutes of of this previously on that 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 I saw was that did that start at the showtime or was that 22 minutes before the showtime I'd have to go back and do my homework I know that before showtime yeah, yeah. you got to see stuff like uh, uh the fat boy slim song uh, okay. uh, 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 uh with uh uh weapon of choice so there was uh, other stuff pre-show yeah, well, yeah. We, yes uh, uh but but like uh, but, but that one featured uh, perfectly, uh, Christopher Walken dancing, doing his song and dance routine to, you know, walk without rhythm and you won't attract the worm and all that stuff. Like there, there was enough good stuff in there. No, I'm just curious if the 22 minutes is equivalent to the 36 minutes of trailers, but more satisfactory because it's related and fun. Or if it was like, oh no, they did that, but they still started the show at the show time, right? That was just pre-show you know, stuff for you. You know what we should do? Would, would would you like would it be cool if I reached out and tried to get the person in charge of pre-show programming at the Alamo and we could do just an interview with them? Yeah, it'd be great. Tell them to show up at your house at April eighth. Uh, no, I'll be <laughs> very busy that day. No, well, I'm joking, of course. But yeah, no, I I love that idea. We should we should absolutely talk to them. Okay. All right, right on. All right. Uh finally uh, we threw out Babylon 5 because we just like to tempt fate as a possible full experience. <laughs> so far, the count is one email for the Babylon 5 full experience, one against. Uh, actually, I have to correct that because <gasps> after, I just in. after I posted that, I went back and I was like, did anybody previously? It's it's two against one for <laughs> Two against. I think because people want us to experience the entire run because it's a narrative and yeah. slicing it into four undermines that. So I, so I, it would I not be the full experience. Exactly. Even though it would by definition, uh, our website is courtkillers.com. Our email address is courtkillers at gmail.com. We are live at twitch.tv slash night attack Mondays at 7 PM Eastern 4 PM Pacific. I reckon we'll talk to you next time.